verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. You know, the Bible said that in 1 Corinthians 1 and 21, that it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. I, I know it seems foolish that God would use broken vessels, vessels that are not perfect, marred vessels, to preach the gospel of Christ. But that's God's will. That's what God's plan was is that men women would preach the gospel of Christ and that men might be saved I want to preach the gospel this morning is that okay is that all right Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 and if you're standing just in the honor of the reading of the word of God God bless you Verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Praise God. It's a great psalm written by David, and I pray that uh, it will minister to our hearts here today, uh, reminding us, if anything, of what God has done. And I believe we sometimes we need to be reminded. There's a lot in this psalm. I hope to bring this out to you today by the grace of God and that it will minister unto your heart. Heavenly Father, as we come before you in the name of Jesus, thank you, God, for this opportunity to stand behind the sacred desk to minister thy word. Thank you for these wonderful people here. They're such a blessing. I love them so much. And I pray, God, that this word would minister unto their heart and strengthen them and edify the church, helping us to remember what you have done for us us and what we are and who we, and what we have in Christ Jesus. And I pray, God, thanking you, Father, giving you the glory that you would draw men unto you and anybody that might ever see or hear or watch this message would come to know Christ as their Savior. As we pray in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. You may be seated. Praise God. I, I, I want to talk about today the joy of forgiveness and thank God for what the Lord has done in our life. There are several things that we can learn from this wonderful psalm that David had written inspired of the Holy Ghost. The first thing I want to say, number one, is it begins with the conclusion. That's right. I said it begins with the conclusion. It's interesting that we'll begin with the end or the conclusion. And we see this in the first two verses of Psalm 32, which we just read just a moment ago. But David is glad that the Lord has forgiven him of his sins. So he begins with a burst of praise. Notice this. He says, blessed or happy is one, the one uh, is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed or happy is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit spirit there is no deceit this is what Jesus does for those that have repented of their sins the repentant soul he takes away the sin and remembers it no more in fact in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25 tells us that God is the one who wipes out our transgressions for his sake and will remember them no more hell glory to God praise the name of the Lord this ought to make us want to shout because never forget what Jesus has done for you and your life praise God to think at one time that we were lost and undone we were steeped in sin and faced and the wrath and judgment of God. But the day that you confessed your guilt and sin to Jesus, guess what God did? He forgave you. In fact, it happened instantly. That moment, I mean, one moment you're in sin, the next moment you have no sin. One moment you're lost, the next moment you're found, you're saved, you're delivered. Praise God. Thank the Lord for what he has done. He washed you with his blood. He covered you, glory to God. He declared you not guilty. The guilt is canceled from the record. One moment you had it, the next moment it's gone. You were just by faith and the heavy weight of sin and the burden was lifted up off of you and now you're brought into right relationship with God and now we can cry, Abba Father, praise God. You belong to God. He's my God. We're in the family of God. We're grafted in. We're adopted in. We belong to the Lord now. No longer belong to the world. No longer belong to sin. No longer belong to Satan. No longer belong to the powers of darkness but brought into the light of God, dear Son. You're now filled with love and His presence. No longer cut off from God but now you've been brought near. No longer are you lost but you're found. You've been purchased and bought and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And this ought to cause us to burst forth with praise and adoration, thanking God for the great things that he's done in our lives. Have you ever just stopped and reflected on what he has done for you? Maybe you're driving down the car on your road, maybe sitting in a coffee shop somewhere, uh, maybe at your office or in your home, whatever it might be, taking a walk down the road. And uh, you just uh, stopped and begin to reflect and to meditate on what God has done for you and how he, what he brought 
brought you out of and the life you used to have and how he brought you into light, how he's changed you, how he's using you. And all of a sudden you burst forth with an adoration of praise and worship and you glorify God and you say, thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're driving down the road in your car and you just think, hallelujah and glory to God. I was doing this just the other day on my school bus and, and, uh, and I was just driving down the road. I had students on my bus and sometimes I just kind of lose consciousness that they're even there. You know, you kind of block them out, you know, kind of concentrate on the road. I was thinking about this and what God's done for us. I just began to thank the Lord and praise God. I'm talking out loud. One of those students looked at me, thought I was crazy. He said, Mr. Mark, who are you talking to? Well, I'm talking to the Lord. That's who I'm talking to. You just want to thank God for what he's done. It's possible that some could have difficulty praising God because they have forgotten. Come on now. I said they've forgotten what God has done for them. It's possible they've forgotten where they've come from, the sin that Jesus delivered them from. Well, maybe this message might remind you of the great things that God has done for you. David could rejoice the fact that his sins are taken care of. David realizes that he's blessed just in the fact that his transgression is forgiven. His sin is covered. That's right, covered. That's the word. In fact, the word covered there. In the Old Testament, they would offer an animal sacrifice which would cover their sins. It was a deposit. Hebrews 10 and 4 says, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So then why do it? Why did God want them to do it? The offering of the sacrifice only covered their sin, but they believed God by faith, listen to this, in the perfect sacrifice that was yet to come. And that perfect sacrifice is none other than Jesus, the Son of God. In the Old Testament, they look toward the cross today. We look back to the cross, and we must never forget the cross. We must never forget Calvary. I love to sing songs about the blood. I love to sing songs about the cross. I love to sing songs about Jesus because it was there that the price was paid. Redemption and atonement. Praise God for the cross of Christ. In fact, Paul said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That world out there that is, that's rejected God, rejecting the salvation of God, rejecting the Son of God, rejecting the love of God, to them it's foolishness that are perishing. But to us, can you say us? That's us, right? Us uh, who are being saved, the Bible said it is the power, hallelujah, of God. Thank the Lord, it's the power of God, the power of God to save, the power of God to heal, the power of God to deliver, the power of God to forgive, the power to God to live holy. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for the cross. The cross of Christ makes a difference. It cleanses the sin-sick soul for those who have repented and accepted it. Amen. Jesus said, uh, Jesus paid the price and, and we have been forgiven. The slate's been wiped clean and so now that we've accepted Jesus, we, we see that we have a new life. We have a new beginning. Does anybody remember? You got a fresh start. Remember when you got saved? Remember when God delivered you? Remember when God set you free? You got a fresh start now. Jesus paid the price and now we praise his holy name. Isaiah 43 and 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. God chooses not to remember your sin. Praise God. It's not God that's bringing up your past sin. God says, I choose not to remember your past sin. The devil will try to bring it up. People try to bring it up and things like this to bring condemnation, but God says, I'm not bringing it up. I remember it no more. I choose not to remember it anymore because the blood of my son is sufficient to wash your sins away and to give you a fresh start and a new beginning. We must understand that even though Jesus forgives us of our sins, it does not suggest that we're perfect. For the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of God's perfection. We shall fall short of God. When we, uh, when we compare ourselves with others, we might look pretty good in our own estimate, but when we compare ourselves with God, we fall miserably short. Short. Isaiah had a vision of God. He saw the Lord high and lifted up in his train, filled the temple. And when he saw God in his holiness, he saw God in his glory. Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And Isaiah saw his ugliness. He saw his sin. He saw his coming short when he saw the glory and perfection of God. Paul said, Not that I've already attained or, or, or already perfected. See, we're surrounded by people in the Bible. 
Bible who were not perfect. Did you know that? That's right. We are surrounded in the Bible by people that were not perfect. They were not, they were not sinlessly perfect. There's not one born outside of Christ that is perfect. In fact, Noah alone stood alone and preached the truth to a wicked and perverse generation. Yet one day he got drunk. Abraham lied twice and yet he was a just man who lived by faith. Moses hit the rock in his temper instead of speaking to it as God instructed. And yet he talked to God face to face and he was a leader of a nation. David sinned and committed adultery, had Uriah killed in battle. And yet the Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart. Even Samson was another one that God used, but Samson failed and stumbled so many times. And although these were not sinlessly perfect men, God still uses those who repent of their sins. See, 1 John 1 and 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But then John said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God uses people like us, imperfect people, amen, to complete his perfect will. Thank God. You know what? I'm not perfect. You said, amen, pastor. I know that because you see my faults and my 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 my, my shortcomings. But you know what? You've got faults and you've got shortcomings too. But that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the blood. That's why we go to him by faith. That's why we have the imputed righteousness of the Son of Jesus Christ. That although we're not perfect, we're in perfect standing with the Holy God. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm sorry. I get excited about that. Amen. Oh, yes, that's right. Now, listen. To confess our sin means to acknowledge our sin. Uh, we talked about this uh, Thursday night, man. Mm -hmm. you, you don't push the blame on somebody else. I mean, you don't put the point the finger of blame uh, to someone else like Adam and Eve did. Adam said, well, you know, it's the woman you gave me, Lord. So he blamed the woman and <laughs> he blamed God. And the woman said, it's the serpent. He made me eat, you know. And so the devil made me do it. We push the blame. You tell the Lord, no, 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 no. You accept responsibility. You tell the Lord you're guilty. I'm the one that failed. I'm the one that stumbled. I'm the one that messed up. Uh, in other words, take ownership. Quit trying to hide behind the fig leaves, right? Man, we talked about that. Don't try to hide behind the fig leaves or somebody else or something else. Uh, but praise God that you acknowledge that sin and confessed it before the Lord. The Holy Ghost brought conviction to your heart. You didn't ignore it. You didn't sweep it under the rug. You confessed it to the Lord by the grace of God. He forgave you. Now get this. He didn't forgive you because you deserve it. All right, not because you deserved it, uh, not because you merited it. No, no, not because you're so good. Fact is, we don't realize how bad we are. <laughs> Amen. Just jump in there now, church. Amen. We don't realize how bad we are. He didn't forgive us because, uh, because we deserve it, not because you, of your good works, not because of your financial status, not because of your, you're popular, not because you gave to the church. Uh, God only forgives those that, that confess their sins to him. In other words, if you don't confess, you don't get forgiven. If you don't if take responsibility, if you don't confess it and admit it and repent of it, then you are not going to be forgiven. Those who repent of wrongdoing, those that don't try to push the finger of blame on somebody else, those are the ones that will be found not guilty. Amen. But God, by his mercy and grace, forgives us. He places that sin in the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. And the Bible says when, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down to the right hand of the majesty on high. And the word purge means that sin is gone and he can't get it back. I don't have time to get into that here this morning. I know I'm already running out of time. A little short on time, but just hold on, church. But just in, in short, this is what it means. That word purged, uh, there you can see in Hebrews 1 and 3. You can circle that in your Bible if you want to. It just means this. The sin is gone, and you can't get it back. You can say, God, remember that sin? God says, no, I don't remember that sin. Well, that sin I just ask you to forgive me for. That's forgiven. That's under the blood. That's right. I don't remember that any longer. You can't get it back. If you have repented of that sin, and you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, then don't let the devil try to bring condemnation. The devil devil's accuser, and he brings accusations against the saints of God. But just know that that sin is under the blood. Not one accusation from the devil will hold water. The Lord will remember it no more. Amen. In fact, in Romans 8 and 1, says, Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Who walk not after the flesh. You don't, you don't live the way you used to live, but now you walk after the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit's going to lead you in the ways of God, the will of God. 
the Holy Ghost not going to lead you to sin. He's not going to lead you somewhere contrary to the will of God. He's not going to lead you to do something outside of the Bible. No, no, no. He'll lead you in the ways of God. It's a walk in the Holy Ghost. If you walk after the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That means you won't walk in sin, but you'll live holy. And it's a walking in the Spirit. It's living righteously. We confess our sins to Jesus, not to be unkind, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to confess your sins to a priest in a confession booth. That's not in the Bible. I'm not trying to make anybody mad, not trying to offend folks, but I want to tell you, I want to go by what the Bible says. I want to adhere to the Word of God. And nowhere in that book, I said nowhere in that Bible, you're going to see where it says that we are to confess to our priest, uh, uh, sins to a priest in a confession booth. You don't confess to Mary. Mary is not called redemptive. I know a lot of people think that she is, but she had to get saved just like we had to get saved. Let me just tell you this. Mary got married to Joseph. I want you to know something, that uh, they had children. I want you to know that too. After Jesus was born, that's right, they had children. Uh, but you don't confess it to Mary or to the Pope or by counting beads or praying to the dead because that's called idolatry. Amen. Nowhere in that Bible does it tell you that you pray to the saints. Amen. Saints, no, no. You don't pray to sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so that's in heaven. You don't pray to this apostle, that apostle, that disciple, this disciple. They had to get saved just like you had to get saved. They're not God. They don't have the power to forgive of sin. The only one, I want to say it very clearly today, that the only one that has the authority and the power to cleanse us and to wash us of all sin is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It is the Lord of glory. You take it to God. You take it to the Lord. And he was the one that will forgive you. Jesus is the only one that can cleanse you of your sin. You must go to him. In fact, uh, uh, let me give you some scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By no other name can one be forgiven but the name of Jesus Christ. The arm of God is not too short that it cannot save. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible said. Uh, the Bible says that God so loved the world that gave you only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we're saved and redeemed and justified by faith. Our faith in God, our faith in the Lord. I know there are some people that think that they can get on the cross and they can be a Savior. No, 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 my friend. The only one, the only blood that was sufficient, the only one that was holy and perfect is God's Son, Jesus Christ. And He's the one by His love got up on that cross, took the nails in His hands for you and I, and His feet, the crown of thorns on His head, so that you can be saved for the joy that was set before Him, despising the shame. Oh, thank God. Jesus knew that we would come to know him. Do you know, hallelujah, how much he must love us? Praise God. So that's the conclusion, amen? That's the conclusion. So I preached the end first. Is that all right? Is that okay? Amen. Number two, let's talk about the cover-up today. The cover-up, Psalm 32, verse 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, say law. What he's saying is in my sin I was dried up. I had no power. I had no strength. Before David confessed his sin, he tried to cover it up. In fact, David kept quiet about it. Unconfessed sin will cause you and I to grieve. Can you say amen to that? That's right. It will cause us to grieve. See, the most miserable people on the planet are Christians that are hiding in their sin. Come on, church. Amen. The ones that aren't doing right. The ones that aren't walking in the world. They're the most miserable people on the face of the earth. It's not so much the lost out there. It's Christians that aren't living right. Christians that are in sin. They're the ones that are in turmoil. They're the ones that are suffering within their soul. That's what David is saying in this psalm. They act like they're happy on the outside, but I can tell you they're not happy. They're not happy. They want to make you think they're happy. They want to make you think that they're enjoying everything, but they're not because deep down they are miserable. Deep down they are empty. Deep down they are alive lonely and even some of them even consider contemplating suicide. God would never have or tempt you to commit suicide because God gives you purpose because God saves you. He gives you life and you see things through the eyes of God and through the eyes of the spirit and God gives you a purpose and a reason to live. Glory to God. Amen. Oh, but many people today, they're miserable. They're empty. They're lonely. Sometimes you might wonder why that Christian is so ouchy. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, why, why are they so ouchy? <laughs> Come on, church, amen. I, I mean, why, why are they in such a bad mood? I mean, it could be that they're hiding something. Mm -hmm. It could be that they're trying to sweep something under the rug. It could be that they're under conviction. Church, I'm telling you, they don't want to admit it. They don't want to deal with it. But it could be that they know they're not doing right. They know there's something not right. They could be, but they're not. God's dealing with them. They're under conviction. The problem, the problem isn't with you at all. The problem really is with the sin issue. It's unconfessed sin, and it's eaten away at their soul. They have no peace and no joy and no victory, and they and they and they don't sense His abiding presence. In other words, unconfessed sin will cause anguish and agony and pain and sorrow and we'll do like Adam and Eve and we'll run from the presence of God and we'll try to hide behind some kind of fig leaves or something like that. And God says, where are you? Where, you where, where are you, Adam? What's happened to you? Why you run from my presence? God knew, but he wanted Adam to answer that. A lot of times we know we're not living right. You know, it's hard to praise, hard to worship. Bound man can't worship God freely. You know that? A bound man can't worship God freely. So sometimes it's hard to praise, hard to worship because we know that there's something in our heart that isn't right with God. We don't feel the Lord is present. God seems so far away. He seems so distant when you pray. It seems that, you know, your prayers only reach the ceiling. It seems like God doesn't hear. And so unconfessed sin will cause all kinds of anguish and agony, pain, and sorrow. Well, what are some of the results of unconfessed sin? Well, number one, let me just say this. Inward, inward turmoil affects outward ability. I want to say unconfessed sin. Inward turmoil affects outward ability. Look at Psalm 32 and 3. It says, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roar all the day long. When something is gnawing at your heart, when something is gnawing you on the inside, you know it affects you on the outside. When something isn't right on the inside, it affects you on the outside. Relationships are strained and we have a tendency to lash out at our loved ones. Maybe the marriage is affected. Friends can be affected. We have a tendency to be grouchy, crabby, or grumpy. Somebody shout amen. amen. Isn't that right? I mean, we can be grouchy, we can be crabby, we can be grumpy. Down south said, you got the reds. That they tell you, oh, you got the reds. <laughs> Something wrong with you. Amen. You're grumpy on the inside. It affects you on the outside. You don't even want to go to your favorite restaurant. You don't feel like eating. You say things like, I'm not hungry, or I can't eat, or you don't even feel like going anywhere. You don't feel like doing anything. Why? Because the internal affects the external. The inner man is where the battle is won or lost. Notice when they built the ark that they had to put pitch on the inside of the ark as well as the outside of the ark. It's not enough just to take care of the outside. You've got to take care of the inside. And if you take care of the inside, it affects the outside. Amen. That, that's why that we as Christians, uh, that we make a difference where we are. You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Christ dwells within your heart. And when things are right with God, you and the Lord, and when your sins are washed and you're cleansed and you're not trying to hide anything, your light will shine even brighter. I know the devil doesn't want your light to shine. I know it's easier to curse the darkness than to bring light into that darkness. But let's bring light into that darkness and let's make a difference. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I was talking to my barber the other day, and I, he was asking me a few questions about the church. I told him we got the property next door and kind of what was going on there. He was really happy we got the property uh, next door, and he talked, started talking to me about the building in the back, and I was sharing with him the things that were going on with that, and he's just smiling. And, uh, you know, I, I stopped him and I said, why, why, why is he smiling, you know? And he said, you know what, Mark? He said, your church is going to make a difference in that area. He said, I can tell right now. Your church is going to make a difference in that area. You're going to clean that up and you're going to be a shining light, an example of what it is. Amen. To let that light shine and declare Christ and to minister the gospel, Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We've got work to cut out. We've got, we got a job to do and we've got a calling to fulfill. Praise God. But others are taking notice and they see what's going on. But number two or B, let me say this. Not only is my external affected, but I experience a heavy hand upon me. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 32. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. So now I've got a heavy hand upon me. You know, unconfessed sin will cause the hand of God to be heavy upon you. No peace, no joy. Got that troubled feeling? Good. Why? Because God is there convicting you. And you will feel that conviction until you repent. See, God chastens his children who he loves. 
And that, that's a good indication. If you can sin and it doesn't bother you, that's a problem. But if you sin and it does bother you, that's a good indicator that you belong to God and God is convicting you. Don't push that away. Don't push it aside. Don't kick it aside. Let God deal with your heart and then respond to it in the right way and get right with the Lord. But number three or C is this. I become spiritually dehydrated. Look at verse 4. says, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. So I'm dried up, if you will. Spiritually, strength, strength has gone out of him. He senses a distance from God. He basically is a plastic man. He's kind of fake. He's kind of artificial. You know what I'm talking about, those people that just go through the motions? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's like it's like you go to church, but you just go through the motions because something isn't right there with you and the God. And so, you know, you're trying to sing, but you really can't sing. And you're trying to praise because, you know, but you really can't praise. And you want to praise because, you know, everybody's probably looking at you and noticing you're not praising. You know what I'm talking about? And so you just go through the motions, you know. And, and so what happens is we become we become kind of like a plastic man. We're, we're fake. We're artificial. I mean, have you ever met a synthetic person before? I mean, they're just being, uh, they're not real or genuine. But this man smiles, but it's just pasted on him. You know what I'm talking about? That guy. You know that fake smile? You know what I'm talking about? You ever seen that Dick Vine Dak show when he was thinking he was going to get a projector for his birthday? You remember that one? He got into the show, and so he thought he was going to get a projector for his birthday, and so his wife was saving some money behind the scenes, and he didn't know it. And so, you know, he found the checkbook and all this kind of thing. He was upset that she's got money behind the scenes. So he realized, oh, she must be buying me a projector. And so and so his birthday, you know, he's trying to get his birthday, trying to hunt for his birthday present. And so finally she brings out a box, and he's got the extension cord ready. You know, he thinks he's going to get a projector. And she and so she goes, you know, you know, she says, Rob, she said, what are you doing with that cord? And he, he plugs it in the box. And, oh, you know, maybe electric blanket, something like that. He thought it was a projector. It wasn't a projector. And so when he's opening up the present, he's got a fake smile on him. He's just going, <laughs> you know, acting like he's happy when he's not. And sometimes as Christians, we can do the same thing. We can act like we're happy when we're not. And we can, be, we can be fake and not junior or not real, okay? And so this kind of guy seems to be looking over his shoulder all the time and because, because he's somewhat suspicious of people. When David sinned against God by committing adultery with Bathsheba, having her husband Uriah killed, I can tell you for that year that David did not have the presence of God. I can tell you he lost his joy. He lost his peace. He lost the presence of God. He lost his song. He lost his music. He lost his strength. He didn't have his vitality left him, if you will. All right. And, and, so, and so what I'm saying here, I'm saying he's not a happy man. And, and he lacks God's presence. And he lacks God's joy and peace and strength. And he feels empty on the inside. And what he needs is a change. And this brings us, really, this brings us to our next word. The word after the fourth verse in Psalm 32 is Selah. You see a word there in your, in your Bible? Selah is a word that has a few shades of meaning. Selah is a, is a musical term, and it means this, to pause. Selah means to think. But the word also means a key change or a modulation to a higher key. We kind of did that here today when we were singing worship this morning. Therefore, one can say, say law, or they can say, there's a change coming. Or they can say, think about this. Or they can say, I feel a change coming. Now, I want you to notice, there is a change coming, and it's seen in the next verse. So, so far, we've dealt with this, the conclusion and the cover-up. But number three, look at the confession. Number three is the confession. Look at Psalm 32 and 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my my sin. That's when you and I experience what? A change. Why? After we confess our sins to the Lord. Not before, but after. Life on a higher plane is available when we confess our sins to God. No longer are we living just in this plane, but we're living in a higher plane, in the presence of God. Oh, glory to the Lord. Oh, the, the Spirit of the Lord fills your heart. The strength of God, the power of God, the presence of God. And now we're living on a higher plane. When we stop hiding our iniquities, and we accept his forgiveness. But notice we confess to him. We confess to him. We don't hide our iniquities from him. It strictly says, I acknowledge my sin to you. So David didn't go to anybody else. And then he says, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And so he forgives, he forgets, he cleanses, he renews, he restores. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's the word again, say law. You see in your Bible there? It's say law. In other words, let's, let's, let's think about this or take some time and let this sink in. Okay, what do we need to think about? Just think about the fact that we're forgiven. Just think about the fact that no judgment of God will come upon 
upon us. No condemnation will come upon us. We will not receive the wrath of God. I know there are people thinking we're going to go through the seven-year tribulation. I do not believe we're going to go through the seven-year tribulation. You know what I'm talking about. Why? Because we will not experience the wrath of God because we've been cleansed. We've been washed. The sin is there no more. No more wrath of God. No more judgment of God. Hallelujah. So think about this. We have been set free and delivered, and now we can walk in the liberty of Christ. We have freedom now. Listen to this. Don't let anything keep you bound. You've got freedom to worship, freedom to praise, freedom to pray, freedom to live for the Lord, freedom to read the word of God. You have freedom and liberty in Christ and God. Not liberty to sin, but liberty and freedom and power to live holy under God for the glory of the Lord. And that's what's pleasing unto God. Oh, boy, hallelujah. Praise God. But what the word say law tells us, there's a change coming. Something's about to happen. Well, what is it? Well, number four is this. Are you ready? Hanging on to this this morning? The consequences of his confession. Verses 6 through 10. Look at the consequences of his confession. Well, what can we learn from verses 6 through 10? A or 1, the godly are affected. Look at this. They learn that if you can be forgiven, they can be forgiven too. If you can be forgiven... They can be forgiven too. Psalm 32 and 6. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you at a time when you may be found. What am I saying? In other words, your testimony is going to have an effect on others. Your testimony will have impact. It will influence others. Others will see a difference. They will see a change. They will see what God has done in your life. And that will encourage them to seek the Lord themselves. It will cause others to draw closer to God, to Jesus. And, uh, and hope will begin to stir in their hearts once again. I mean, think about this. Have you ever noticed that when somebody is healed, that causes a stirring in the hearts of others? I mean, they say this. They say, if God can heal them, then I know that God can heal me. You ever, you ever, you ever thought about that? You ever, that ever happened to you? If, if God is moving and if God touched them, if God healed them, I know God can heal me. Hallelujah. Now, now, all right. So, you know, uh, the, it's a battle sometimes, isn't it? And one of the ways Satan fights me hard is in my health. And I just keep going. I tell you, church, I just keep plugging away at it. I just keep going, I keep going, I keep going. And the last day on earth here, I'll be done here, and I'll be in the presence of God. And so, you know, they've, they've, they've been concerned about some things. And so, you know, the blood work wasn't coming out back the best. And they were concerned about some things. And so, you know, they caught the bladder cancer early. Praise God, they caught it early. And so it's been a year now. There's been no cancer in the bladder for a year. Well, they're concerned that there was cancer someplace else on my body. So they were checking in my kidneys and they were checking in my liver and they were checking other places in my body about cancer. But there's one area that seems suspicious because the blood numbers were not good. They were, they were not good. They were, it, was, it, was, it was not good. <laughs> and so they, they did an MRI. They wanted to see what's going on. And they tried some things and, and whatever. And said, so we'll just keep an eye on it. That's what they said. Well, they keep the blood work. We'll just keep numbers. We'll just keep looking at it, okay? And so I said, okay. So I just keep on preaching. I just keep doing what I can. Keep serving the Lord. Hey, man, just keep on trying. You know what I'm talking about? So my wife and I were trusting God. We're believing God. We're praying. We're crying out to the Lord. And so they said, you got to go get the blood work done. Well, I didn't want to get blood work done because I don't like getting blood work done because I don't know what the number's going to say. I'd rather just not remember. I just, I just forget about the whole thing until I have to get blood work done. So on, on Friday, I had to go get blood work. And so the blood work came in Friday evening. It was at the house. It came on my phone. And I looked at my numbers. I said, that's good. 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 Cholesterol's even lower. It's even getting better. And then there was this one number that they're concerned about. And that number was way lower. And I looked at my wife and said, you're not going to believe this. I said, I don't know how this is happening. I said, but the numbers are good. I mean, they're good. And, man, I'm telling you, the power of God. All I can say is the power of prayer. And it's the best numbers I've had in a long time. I'm saying, praising God. If you will be obedient to the Lord, just walk in the Holy Ghost of God, you see that healing will come along the way. I remember a preacher saying this, Brother H. Clinton, and said, if you'll just obey God and you'll walk in the will of God, healing will come. And so that's what you got to do. You got to be obedient to the Lord. You got to trust Him by faith. And so, amen, what God is doing in my life, I pray that it encourages you in your life. Amen. I don't know what's going on with the heart. The thing's still ticking, praise God. Every once in a minute, every once in a while, all that kind of thing. But most of the time, a lot of times, 
times when I'd come up just to start the service, I don't know, a rush and adrenaline or something like that would burst in my body, and so my heart would go into AFib. Always, a lot of times when I was praying, opening up the service for church, I was in AFib for about five or ten minutes, something like that, until I finally quit. Well, praise God, since the surgery, I haven't been in AFib yet, beginning the service, all right? We've had a few little here, nicks here and there, but I thank God for that. I don't know what's going to happen, but i tell you what, we got to put our trust in, our, in the Lord, our God. Listen to me. I know times are tough. I know things are difficult. Sometimes you wonder where God is. Let me tell you this. God hasn't gone anywhere. God is still God. He just needs a people that today that will stand on the truth and stand on the word of God. People that will pray when Jesus will turn returns will he find faith on the earth. People that will be faithful. People that will pray. People that will believe, still believe God. Let me tell you this. God is still saving. God is still delivering. God is still healing. God is still baptizing in the Holy Ghost. And Jesus Christ is coming back for the redeemed of the Lord. Listen to me. I'm trying to tell you, I've experienced the hand of God in my life, the healing power of God in my life. When God decides to take me home, he'll take me home. But until then, you and I got to keep preaching, keep serving, keep declaring Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and doing what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. All right. So, so your your testimony is going to have an effect on others. Your your your, your testimony has an impact, has influence, makes a difference. They'll see a change. Praise God. I mean, if they say if God can heal you, then God can heal me. When somebody gets saved, it causes us stirring in our hearts to pray for others to get saved. When someone is delivered from drugs or alcohol, it causes us to pray for others to pray for deliverance. When somebody is baptized in the Holy Ghost, it causes others to seek for the Holy Ghost. If God is moving and God baptized them, I know that God can baptize me. Your testimony will have an impact on others. The Christian life will affect others. Your relationship with Jesus touches others. It will speak to others. They might not say anything, but your life speaks. People watch, they look, they listen. I mean, let them see God working in your life. Let them see. And through that, they will know that what we have and believe in is not something that's fake or false or phony, but something that's real and genuine. This is real. Hallelujah. David also said, surely the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. And we see that in verse 6. Notice it says him. It didn't say his stuff. Not his things. In other words, they can take my car, but they can't take away my joy. And they might take away everything from you. Listen, they can take everything they have, uh, we have away from us, but they cannot take away my joy. They cannot take away my peace. They cannot take away my Jesus. They cannot take away my salvation. They cannot take away my God. With forgiveness of sins, there will be a sense of inward peace and security that only God can give you. The world doesn't understand this kind of security. They think that security is in having riches and fame and success, but security can be only found in Jesus. Jesus said, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And loses his own soul. So I know that God, they are affected. But number two, David is affected. He now sees God differently. He says in verse 7, you're my hiding place. So what is he doing? So he makes God personal. It's my hiding place. He moves towards God. Notice David's moving towards God. <laughs> because why? Because the sin's forgiven. The Lord shall preserve him from trouble. God, God is his preservation, his protection. The verse continues on saying this. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. God is all around me. That's what he's saying. God is all around me. David said, you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. He hears music from all sides. He sings along with it. Paul and Silas heard a song, and they sing it unto God with earth-shattering results. Sing the song that God has put in your heart. David said, I will sing a new song to you, oh God. Oh God, God will put a song in you. And you can sing. Worship God. But notice this. Here's the word. Say law. There's another change that's about to take place. Now, what do we see? Well, number one, we see the God they are affected. Number two, we see that David is affected. But number three, notice this. God is affected. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Psalm 32, 8, 9. I will instruct you to, and teach you in the ways you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I'll guide you with my eye. Do not be like the, a horse or the mule, which have no understanding. I'll guide you with my eye. I like that. Amen. Just, just God just looking at us. We catch, we, we, we catch his eye. <laughs> We can be so close to God and be so sensitive to the Holy Ghost that God will lead us just by looking at us, us looking at him. And when we catch his eyes and his eyes catch us, he will lead and he will guide us and instruct us in the way we should go. I will know that I know that I know that it is the Lord. Amen. Praise God. 
I'm driving down the road. I got 55 kids on my bus. It's Friday. The weather's cooler. They're all excited. They're going crazy. They're going crazy. And they know the rule is you got to make sure that you're sitting down in your seat no matter what. No matter what. I got great kids. Elementary, they're great. They're fantastic. They're wonderful. They really are. I love them, and I'm so glad to get rid of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm driving down the road, you know, Friday, you know. And I look. I got this big mirror, and I look in the back, and I see a few wonderful students, and they're standing up, and they know they're supposed to be standing up. And so I'm busy. I got traffic. I, get, I don't have time to grab the mic and, and tell them, sit down, okay? I, I got hands on the wheel. I got traffic. I got cars everywhere, okay? And so I look up at the mirror. I glance up. I glance up. I glance up. And I glance up. Finally caught their eye. And they caught my eye. And the reason why they look in the mirror is because they want to see if I'm looking if they're standing. Because they know what they're doing is wrong. And so we finally, we finally lock up. Boop. You know, we caught eyes. And I go, all I do is that. And they go, Poof. you don't have to say a word. And when you're so sensitive to the Lord, come on now, when you're clean, when you're washed, when you're, when you're close to God, God may not have to say a word to you. He might just do this. He just catches you with his eye, and he leads you, and he guides you. Oh, now, what happens now? What happens now that we've come clean with God? Now God begins to act further in our lives. He begins to teach us. He will guide us in a way that we should go. He will speak to our hearts. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. He tells us to keep our eyes on him. He will guide us by his presence. It's hard to have the leadership of the Holy Spirit if we're not looking at Jesus. If we're looking at everybody else, but we're not looking at Jesus, it's kind of hard to be hard to follow the Lord. He will be a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You will hear a voice behind you telling which way you should go, and you'll walk in it, my friend. Sin keeps us from looking in his direction, but confession of sin will clear up our eyesight. You will see clearer. Jesus said, anoint your eyes with eyes have that you may see. So what am I saying? Repentance will sharpen our eyesight. It will cause us to see clearer. It will sharpen your spiritual senses. You'll have a greater discernment. You people that don't have to wear glasses, you're blessed. But if you have to wear glasses like I do, and, and I have to wear them all the time. When I get up in the morning, i got to put them on. Before I go to bed, I take them off. I mean, I can't, I just, I can't see without them, okay? Everything's blurry, all right? So, so, you know, sometimes I'll go like two or three days without cleaning my glasses. I just kind of forget to clean them. And I'm just wearing them, okay? And I'm wearing them, wearing them, wearing them, wearing them, wearing them. Wearing them. And then I realize, all of a sudden, I realize, man, I can't hardly see how these things. And I, and I pull them off and I look and I'm, oh, my goodness gracious, they're dirty, terrible. And so, and so sometimes they're so bad, i got to wash them under the water in the sink several times. Several times. Wash, 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 wipe, wipe, wipe. Wash, 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 wipe, wipe, wipe. You know what I'm talking about. You people know the glasses. You know what I'm talking about, right? And, and so finally I get them clean. I get them clear. And i got another pair of glasses I can put on to see if these glasses are clear. <laughs> they're my backup pair, okay? Not quite as strong as these, but they'll get by, okay? You know what I'm talking about? i got a backup pair that I look at to see if these are clean. And so finally I get these things clean. And I put them on and I go, whoa. I didn't know they were so dirty. In other words, I didn't know that I could not see so good as I could until I cleaned them. And when you, and when you confess it to God and he cleanses you and washes you and you get things right with the Lord, all of a sudden you can see clearer than you've ever seen before. God cleans your glasses. He washes them up so that you can see and have greater discernment. Spiritual senses are renewed. God will teach us uh, to stop being stubborn and obstinate like the horse or the mule. A mule can be very stubborn, headstrong, willful. Don't resist God. Don't resist the word. Don't resist repentance. Uh, don't kick against conviction. All right. I'm almost done. <laughs> Praise God, Pastor. Stubbornness will only delay what's next. Now, sometimes we're, we're like resisting God. It's like, why are we resisting God? We resist him in worship. We resist him in praise. We resist him in prayer. We resist the word. Why? Why aren't you in the word? Why aren't you in prayer? Why aren't you worshiping? Why? Why do we resist him? That is, if we know him, if we're saved, why do we resist him? Now, Look at number five. I want to talk about this, the celebration. Look at this, the celebration. Psalm 32, 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. That's us. That's us. Be glad and rejoice, you righteous. And shout for joy. Shout for joy. Shout for joy. All you upright in heart. You, you, don't, you don't have to continue to feel miserable, wretched, desolate, and gloomy anymore. You, you, you don't have to continue to be stubborn. Too many people are stubborn these days. I hope it's not you, but... 
boy, today we're living in a society, and, and even, even, even church people can be obstinate. You ever had that problem? I mean, in fact, by being stubborn, we delay the time we could have felt the joy, peace, and comfort of the Lord, the presence of God. In other words, we're missing out. We're only hurting ourselves. We're only hurting ourselves. Okay. Praise God. There's a story about a little boy. And he was visiting his grandparents. And he was given his first slingshot. <laughs> Remember that, Michael? <laughs> and, and he practiced, but he could never hit the target. And so coming back to Grandma's yard, he saw her pet duck. And so on impulse, he took an aim and he let her fly. And guess what? He killed the duck. So being that he killed the duck, he hit the duck in the woodpile. The thing is, his sister was watching him the whole time, but she didn't say anything to him. And after lunch, Grandma said, Sally, help me with the dishes. And Sally said, Johnny wants to do that, don't you, Johnny? And she whispered to him and said, remember the duck. <laughs> so guess what? Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandma asked if the, uh, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandma said that she needed Sally to help her with, to make supper. And so Sally said, Johnny wants to help with that. Would you help you do that, don't you, Johnny? And she whispered, remember the duck. And so then Johnny proceeded to help Grandma with the supper. And several days of doing this, his and his sister's chores, Johnny couldn't take it anymore. And he went to his grandma and said, I killed the duck. And the grandma said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the window. And I saw the whole thing. And so she gave him a big hug and she said, because I love you, I forgive you. But the thing that I wondered was, she said, how long you were going to let Sally make a slave out of you. <laughs> I think you all know what I'm talking about, don't you? How long are you going to let Satan make a slave out of you? Mm. You can confess and celebrate your forgiveness and freedom in Christ today. The choice is yours. The Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And you might say, but pastor, we're all saved. Maybe so. I hope so. I hope everybody is saved. But just because you're in church doesn't mean you're saved. But that doesn't mean that everyone is living in the way that they could be or should be for the Lord. Don't let the devil make a slave out of you. Don't let Satan bring condemnation in your life. Praise God for the cross and for the blood. Now, as Christians that are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of the Lamb, let's do as verse 11 says. It says here, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Shout for joy, all you up, you're getting it now, all you upright in heart. Shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Shout for joy, all you that are upright in heart. Thank God. Thank God for the blood. You're, are you saved? Are you redeemed? Are your sins washed away? Are you forgiven? Yeah. Oh, praise God. Then guess what? We're not under condemnation. But we are free indeed. We are free in Christ Jesus. Thank the Lord. I don't want anything to be between me and God. I want to trust him. God, help me to trust you. Help me, God, to trust you. Help me, God, not to look at circumstances. Help me, God, not to look at people, their faithfulness or lack thereof. But help me, God. Help me, Lord. Help me, help me, help me, God, to keep my eyes on you. That's what I want. Hallelujah. You know, when I was a kid and I was doing something wrong, it was hard to look at Mama. Mama. You know that? It was hard to look at her. And my mama tried talking to me, and I got my eyes kind of down like this, you know, because she knows I'm guilty, but I'm trying to pretend I'm not guilty, okay? And it's hard to look at her, you know, because I feel shameful. And, and I, I know I did wrong. 
And also, not only did I do not what I did, what I wasn't supposed to do, okay? Like, I didn't do my chores. But guess what I did? I lied be- trying to get out of the problem. So I made myself worse, digging a bigger hole. And I'm like, oh, man. So then you're, you're lying. She knows I'm lying. I think she knows I'm lying, but I, I'm hoping she doesn't know. And so I, you tell another lie. And now you got a couple lies behind you. Plus, you didn't do what you're supposed to do, right? So now I'm really in trouble. And it's really hard to look at my mom when I knew I was guilty. And so we're, I'm looking away. My mom says, look at me. Oh. So I got to look at her. And she says, Mark. Well, actually, it was Jungers at the time. And she would say, now, this is what she'd do. Mom, you know. <laughs> Mark Anthony Jungers, are you lying to me? That was tough. And, and so I would say, no. <laughs> she knows, man. She's trying to get me to confess. And she's saying, Mark Anthony Jones, you better tell me the truth. Are you lying to me? No. <laughs> What's she trying to do? She's trying to get me to come clean. I got to come clean. With, with my mom. And a lot of times we just got to come clean with the Lord. And so it was the time, you know, I'd, when I was younger, I used to get tonsillitis really bad all the time. I don't get it so much now. I still got my tonsils. The doctor says his tonsils need to come out. My mom says, I've got my tonsils. He's keeping his tonsils. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. I appreciate it. I was sick all the time. Running fever all the time. Missed school lots because of tonsillitis. Do they have any more tonsillitis? They got everything else. Seems like when COVID came, we didn't, we didn't have anything else, right? And so, and so I'm sick, right? And, and we're going to the doctor. She has to tell me I've missed school. We're going to the doctor. And because I had a tendency of not telling my mom the truth, we're going down the road. 67 Camaro, by the way. <laughs> we're going down the road. I'm in the passenger seat. I'm not feeling good. We're going to the doctor, missing school. My mom looks over at me. She says, Mark, are you telling me the truth? You better not be lying to me. Are you sick? I said, Mom i got a 102 fever. She goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not faking it, okay? That's right. All right. <laughs> she remembers this. <laughs> I was sick. And so finally you confess to my mom. She finds out. I get in trouble. I get grounded. I, uh, oh, gracious, you guys, we've got to quit, but I, I would ride my bicycle. I was in Manhattan Beach, and I loved to ride my bicycle all over. I'd go to the beach. It was seven blocks down going to the beach, seven blocks up, coming home. And they had hills, man. You can go down these hills, and I was riding with my friend. And uh, I wasn't supposed to be riding my back. I was grounded from it. I wasn't supposed to be riding it. And, uh. So my friend and I were going down a steep hill, and my front tire got right behind his back tire. And we're flying down this hill and going down the street. And he decides to turn right, and his back tire cut off my right tire. And I went, blah, 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 terrible, worst wipe I'd ever had. I mean, it was bad. I was all banged up, a ball bruised up, big old knot on my head. And so my friend's mama said, we got to call your parents. We got to call your mom. Don't call my mom, whatever you do. Don't call my mom. Don't tell her I'm not supposed to be riding my bike. Don't call my mom. What are you going to tell her? I'm going to tell her that I fell down the stairs with my bicycle. <laughs> she called my mom. My mom came off of work, came and got me. Bike's all beat up. I'm all beat up. Bike's all bent up. <laughs> a mess. And my mom says, well, she says, I think this time you might have learned your lesson. You know? Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that a lot of times we get ourselves in a predicament. And I can't blame anybody else. I disobeyed my mom. I should have been riding my bicycle. I was grounded already. Now I'm really grounded, right? And a lot of times we disobey the Lord. And we feel the guilt and the shame. It's hard to look at God. It's hard to get direction from the Lord. It's hard to hear his voice. It, when you read the word, it's hard to receive anything from the Lord. Or if you do receive something from the Lord, he keeps reminding you of this sin that's in your life. 
He keeps reminding you and reminding you and reminding you. Why? Because he loves you. And he, he's a jealous God, the Bible says. And he doesn't want anything between you and him. Nothing. He doesn't want anybody. He doesn't want anything between you and him. Okay? Understand that. Christ must have supremacy. He must be first. You honor God first. You put God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And a lot of times we find ourselves in a mess, in a turmoil, a crisis. And it could be because of our own doing. You can't blame the world. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame God. You have to take full responsibility. You quit hiding behind the fig leaves. And we got to come clean with the Lord. Amen. And when you do, there'll be a celebration and you can praise him and you can worship him and you can glorify him. Let's stand together here today. Abby, would you, would you come? Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's praise him this morning. Amen. Let's glorify the Lord. Let's, can we do this? Can we sing? Izzy, or could you do it? Can, are you able to sing thank you, Jesus, for the blood? Are we able to do that? Can we do that, James? Come on, James. Come on. One more time. One more time. And when we sing this song, let's just truly be thankful and grateful for the cross and for the gospel and for the blood. Let's worship him. Let's rejoice in him. If there's something in your life that didn't right, then come clean with the Lord. Come clean with God, you know. As we're singing, as we're worshiping, then confess it to the Lord. If you want to come to the altar and pray, then come and pray. But be freed up. Freed up. Let this church be freed up and have liberty, liberty to praise, to worship. Don't let the devil take away your praise. Don't let the devil take away your joy. Let's praise him today, amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have a mic here. Thank you. Let's sing together, church. As a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time. right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb thank you Jesus for the blood of life thank you Jesus 
and the wonder working power of the blood, the blood, and calls the sons and daughters, we are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood, there is none too stronger than the one. for Jesus, what God has done in our lives. I just, I just want to be honest with God, truthful with the Lord, confess it to God. If you're struggling with some kind of temptation, then take it to the Lord and say, God, I'm struggling. Take it to Him now. If you're not right with the Lord, take it to Him now. If you've been doing something you know isn't pleasing to God, then take it to Him now. Don't hide anymore behind the fig leaves, but confess it. Confess it to Him. Amen. You, listen, God wants to save. He wants to deliver. Maybe somebody may be watching right now, or maybe they will one day. Maybe this message is speaking to you. Inside your heart, you're miserable, you're empty, you're lifeless. You know you're not living right for the Lord. You know you're in sin. You know that if you were to die today, you would go straight to hell. You wouldn't even go to heaven. You'd go straight to a lost and dying if you died today. And you could die today. This could be the day that your number is called. But God is trying to reach out to you. And the Lord says, I love you. And the Lord says, I want to save you. Call on his name. If you'll take it to the Lord and you'll confess it to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me for all my sins, for all my past, for all my undoneness. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And about 2,000 years ago, I know that Jesus died on the cross for me. He shed his blood for me. He gave his life for me. I put my faith and trust in him. Lord, I accept you as my Savior. Come into my heart. Save me. Save me, Lord. Wash me. Forgive me. According to your word, I come by faith, not by works, not by merits. But God, your blood can wash and cleanse. And so, Lord, right now, I make a decision to turn away from my sins, to repent of them. I make a decision right now, right now, 
to ask Jesus to come into my life, into my heart, and to forgive me. Isn't that wonderful? And at this moment, if you do this and you mean it in your heart, at this moment you're cleansed, you're justified by faith. But it has to be a choice that you make. You can choose to accept him or reject him. I believe that the church will experience the power of God in greater degrees if the church would have a whole lot less of the world and a whole lot more of Christ. If, 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 if there'd be a whole lot more of Jesus and a whole lot less of self. If he would increase and we would decrease, God could do great things, wonderful things, mighty things. Paul's preaching wasn't with persuasive words of human wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the Spirit and in power. God hadn't changed. He's still here. Believe him by faith. Amen. Praise God. Father, almighty God, as we come to you today in the name of the Lord, I thank you for your saving grace. Maybe there's somebody hurting somewhere. I know there are. And they need help. Father, I pray that they would not turn away from you. But I pray right now in their sorrow and their hurt and their pain and their brokenness and their despair, that they'll know that Jesus, that you love them. And he's right there to help them if they'll reach out to you, if they'll call upon the name of God, ask God to save and forgive and to cleanse and to wash. He'll make you new. He'll make you whole. Touch him, Lord. Help him, Lord. There's a world that's hurting. There's a world that's lost. We are living in the most perilous times. So God, I pray for this nation. I pray for souls. I pray for our lost children, our loved ones. I pray for the church. Touch the church. Oh, God, let us be true to you, honest. Let us look at you in your eyes. Father, I pray that we'll be led by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Oh, how much we do love you and adore you. Bless the congregation, the church, the body of Christ. We give you all the glory. Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. God's good church, amen. Tonight we'll have service at 630. Thank you for coming today. Uh, you're such a blessing. Come back tonight if you can. We'd love to have you, our evening service. We continue our time of worship and praise unto God and the ministering of his word. God bless all of you. Wonderful time. God bless you. Love you.